there is some important details that I should warn in you for anything. Uh, generally, when we talk about reliability, uh, we have many, many workers on the basis that uh, we are working with the distributions of components and trying to build a system with good reliability. Our point of view here is uh, quite different. Uh, our point of view is we have a system, we have a system working, and we are trying to understand how these components are working inside the system. So uh, it's more like, uh, I could say, an uh, back engineering. We are looking for, once we put all components together, what is happening to them? What is the distribution of them? Uh, what is in each sense? Uh, our main interest is the time of failure. So how much time or how much confiability, uh, reliable is this system and components. Okay, based on that, the first of all, we will start with a simple example, a toy example, to understand what we are talking about. Consider uh, that we have a coffee machine. And uh, this will be a really simple coffee machine. Uh, why really simple? Because, of course, there is many and many uh, components in a coffee machine, but here we are considering only two components inside this. We have the greens, uh, the, the greens that uh, uh, the greens of the grain and the heat system to heat the water. So I only have two components here. A really simple one. How does this work? If I, the greens are working well, the heat system is not working, we cannot use the coffee machine. So we have a problem and this coffee machine will be broken in some way. If only the heat system is working, I don't have grains to use and build my coffee, to make my coffee, again, I have a problem and this will not work. So this is a kind of a, just a simple system with two components. If this one is broken, I cannot have my coffee. If this one is broken, I cannot have my coffee. But not only this. If the first one is broken, I cannot observe the failure of the second component. So this is the problem here. We call series systems in the language of reliability. But if you think in survival analysis language, maybe you can call this by a competing risk model. OK, so the main idea of our we have the time of the system. What is the time? We are here always talking about time. It's a failure time. So we are interested to understand this failure time. And we have the two components, X1 and X2. Ah, we are talking about the failure time of two components. So again, this is an important point. Our main interest is in the reliability function of the component J. In this case, it's just one or two components, but our main interest here is in component, not exactly at the system. I will talk more about uh, that later, uh, the, the difference between working with component bases or system bases. Of course, we also can work in the systems, but our main interest is how a component is working inside that system. And we will mainly work based on this function. Our interest is, I am able to estimate this function based on data of the system. And, well, if one component fails, I have a second component that I don't know the time of, because this is not working, or it is, uh, no, it must be working. The first one produced the failure of the system. So the time of the system here, in this case, is just the minimum. Uh, and 
generally we have it here a hide information. We cannot observe x1 or x2. In this case, x1 and x2, we, we are calling this the time of failure of each component. We only have information about t, the time of failure of the system. Um, okay, so uh, inside this uh, series system, it is the simple example. If I am working on this bit, uh, let me example, uh, give a better example about uh, how I can represent this kind of data. What exactly wha what we are doing. So consider, for example, this coffee machine, we have uh, 10 samples of systems. So I put uh, 10 different coffee machines to work with these two components, and I observe the failure time of each coffee machine. This will be a sample of size 10, and uh, also we not only use the time t. Here we have again another important point. We have a mark. What is this mark? What is this function or this uh, indicator function? We know the failure time of the system. We observe the failure time of system. And we observe who produced this failure. What was the component that produced the failure? So in the case here, we observe time t and, for example, x1 was the first component to failure. So we know that the time t was produced by the failure of component 1. What has happened to component 2 in this case? It must work because the system failed in component 1. So, for example, if component 1 failed in 10 minutes, what is the failure time of component 2? Okay, better to use the other one. Okay. Okay, so uh, let me remember where I am. Uh, the component, uh, oh, so the component two uh, in 10 minutes must be working. So I will not, be, it is not be possible for me to find or to observe the failure of component two because my machine is broken. Uh, here I should uh, call attention for another fact in reliability. There is other works, is not our aim here, that you can find, uh, that you can uh, work with a replacement piece. So you find the time of the component one, it was broken, you substitute this piece, you put another component, put the system to work again, and then you may find a failure of component two. Uh, here we are not working on this basis, we are working in, if the system failure, I have just Time one, time two, ah, what is component two? More than 10. The failure of component one was in 10 and this produced the failure of the system. Component two will be more than 10. Uh, and what I do with the system? It's broken uh, it's broken. So uh, the part of replacements, it, I will may talk about that little at the end, but uh, for now, don't think about that, please. Okay, so we have this mark that is saying the J component was the responsible of the failure of the system. It's important to, to call here what we uh, saying about responsible for the failure of the system. We have other structures for systems, of course, and uh, to the system failure, to have the system failure, we will need more than one component failure before the system is broken. For example, if you find, if you're thinking about a plane, I hope if one of uh, the turbines of the plane failure, he can keep flying. Uh, so we are not in saying that all components are producing. No, when we call this component responsible for the system failure, we are saying the last component that failure and then the system failure. Of course, may 
other components failure before, and this is contributing to the system failure, but uh, we are saying this for the last one. Okay, so our data is a uh, kind of this type of data. Uh, we have the time and who is responsible for this failure. So here, you can find uh, any units here, it's just an example, so it can be minutes, years, uh, hours, for us is more like a, it, this is possible numbers for times, and here the system failure with 1.92, and component one was the last one. So in this line also I know something about component two, but I also know that component, uh, about component one, and also I know that component two failed after 1.92. Here, component one failed after 1.85, and it was the failure of component two. And the same for all these lines. Of course, we will not work only on a series system with two components. So, other types of systems that we may have. If you consider a parallel system, and here, thinking in three components, in this case, for the system failure, I need that all components failure. This is what I was talking early about. Uh, who is the responsible for the system failure? If you're thinking in the, uh, the problem, in this case, to have the system failure, all components must be responsible for system failure because I need that all of them are failed. This is what I was recalling. We are calling for responsible of failure, the last one. In this case, in the series systems, we had the minimum time. Now we had the maximum time. The system will only fail when all components had failure. And with one component, the other one in the series system is bigger or lower. Now, we know. If the system failed by component three, what is the information that I have of component two and component one? Both failed before this time, not after now, because all components must fail. Uh, thinking in an uh, example of seven samples of this kind of system, what kind of information we have? For example, here, the system failed with 0 0.18. Component one was the last to failure. So, okay, we have this and component two and component three failure before 0 0.18. Uh, okay, but uh, someone can start to think about how you know what component produce the failure. Uh, suppose that this is possible, and something like uh, I have in my system, I am testing, so I put one uh, mark to know what, what each one is working or not working, and the last one to failure. This kind of problem, okay, I can say, it's not uh, so easy to have uh, this kind of formation, but uh, we start in working in this to extend our problem to the next uh, Okay, if this information is not available. So first, let's think that we have all this information available, the time and the last component to failure. Also, another thing that's important, we still need to know the structure of our system. We may talk more about this too. Yeah, of course, we are trying to work in an structure more complete than just a series and parallel system. So uh, our talk here is about uh, estimation in coherent system. What is a coherent system? How we can work in this kind of problem? Uh, and uh, for example, a simple definition about coherent system. Forget any figures, any pictures, what we call about a current system is any current system does not have a useless component. What you are calling by useless component, 
See this picture. Uh, component two here. You never produce, never will produce the failure of the system. So the reliability of the system, we have here an a useless component because uh, it's only possible to fail by component one. If component one failure, we will have these two parts of component of the system. The failure of this and the system will fail. Well, now may you are thinking, how you can put a component here and here, and this is the same component? How can I build a, a system like that? So, this is a representation of a system. This may not exactly how it, the, this system is working or how the system was built. Uh, in the next examples, we will see better how we can possible have this structure or, may, or better how we can have this representation of a current system. Uh, another important thing in current systems is that any current system can be represented by a combination of series and parallel system. This is important because we are not exactly working with the structure of the systems, but we are working with the representations of these structures. Uh, another interesting uh, structure, so this will also be important. For current systems, I said, ah, we can represent this as a series parallel systems or parallel series system. And what is this? Here we have a series, so think that this part is just one component. The big picture of the system is just a series system. So if I look this part, calling this as one component, this component is a parallel. So we call this a series, and one of them is parallel. This is structure, we call that by series parallel system. In this structure, what is our big picture here? We have a parallel structure, and inside of each parallel, we have a series system. So this one we call by a parallel series system. This is important for us because this kind of representation will allow us to perform these estimations in coherent system. So, of course, the original system has his properties. Uh, it was built in different ways but we can represent them in series parallel or parallel system. And, and here I also would like to call the attention because uh, I'm always doing advertisement about this book. I don't know exactly why, but I really like this one. Uh, this book of Barlow Prochan, it's a probability book about reliability. So. The basic definitions or the basic uh, probability relations that we need to build our estimation is here. Uh, all constructions, how can I represent a system, how I can change it, how can I look at for it. So we have many backgrounds here. The main uh, details in this book, uh, at least in my point of view, is they did all probabilities all results thinking. I know the distribution of the failure time of the component, of all the components. I know the structure. I know the all conditions necessary to build the reliability of the system. So it's more like a probability work than a statistic work. Our point in relations to, to this work is we are now in the other hand. We don't have all the information about the system. We only have observed time. I don't know the structure or any, any model or any idea how this component's working. So we are going back. One thing is we have all components, all distributions of failure time, everything defined, then built the reliability of the system, then you can look how this is working. But 
our main question here is, uh, see for example, let me see a simple example. If, X, uh, if this component one has a exponential distribution with mean one, this one has exponential distribution with mean two, this one has exponential distribution with mean three. Ah, if I know the distributions of the systems, uh, little assumptions here, they are independent, then I can put all together and build the system reliability. This one thing, what we want to do or what we are talking about today is, I have these components, I have these structures, of course, we will have some assumptions, but I have no idea how these components work more than this. It's true that if I put all these three components working together, when I know the distribution, they will work as the original distribution, or may, when I put them together, this can affect how this component work. So, okay, I know that the turbine of the plane working in one way, but when I put this turbine with another one together, and they are working, and they are flying, the reliability of this turbine is the same as I did in my lab. So what we are uh, talking here is, you can build the system, okay, we know how to do that. So how can I check to be sure that the things are working as expected? So this is in some way our main idea here. Uh, and here, again, for example, in this kind of system, if component one failure, just component one produced a failure, the system is working, and I don't have any information. The only thing that I know is the system is working. If both component one and two failure, now I know that the system is broken. If component two was the second to failure, so it was the responsible for the failure of the system, what I do know, component one failure before component two, and component three will failure after this time of component two. So now our observed time has two options, or better, three options. The failure of component, it was failure before that time or failure after that time. Uh, and this we generally call this by sensor time. I, I do here in a parallel or on a counterpart for missing data. Uh, the main difference for uh, us working here from missing data, because if you think that component one is broken and component two produce the failure of the system. I have missing data for one and three. The main difference from missing data is that we have an informative missing data. What is, what I'm calling by informative missing data? I know that component one failed before some time. It's not just, uh, I don't know about this. I know something. And also I know something about component three, must failure after some time. Okay. But uh, I say it. How it's possible to do this kind of a structure? How a same component can be together here in, uh, in different parts is the same component. Uh, physically, it's impossible to produce this. So this is, I call, a logical representation. Or, and this kind of uh, symbols here, we call by a box diagram. And, and here we have a, a, a very interesting example. Uh, and I have to tell a small story about this component or this system because uh, I spend a lot of time looking for a system like this in the real world. I don't like to say real world because uh, anything is real, but uh, then uh, after some time discussing and asking, I discovered that Barlow and Prochamp added this structure to their book 
to give a, a very interesting example of a really complicated system. And I never find this one in the real world. So I was quite in first state about that. Uh, because if you look at the system, this is called by a bridge system. Uh, what is happening here? Thinking in a natural way of uh, energy going inside. I will put some energy here and I want to know what happens to this energy at the end point. Thinking in the possible paths for this energy. The energy can start coming to this line, then come to this line and goes to the end point. But can start here, go to here, get down and go there. But also, it's quite strange because we can, we can go down, then up, and get back. So, at this component here in the middle, if you think in this kind of energy stuff, the energy can go up and down at the same time. So, this is quite strange. And uh, I should say, yeah, probably Barlow and Prochan was quite smart to build this representation. It's in three, uh, this called my, uh, our attention and how oh, I want to solve this problem. This problem is quite nice. It's a confusing what is working here and uh, let's find a system working in... Uh, sorry, we didn't find it. But again, the representation is quite nice and then uh, we want to work in this kind of problem. And... Here is the main detail that we can talk about. How a same component can be in two different places. Think in one way. Uh, I told before, any current system can be represented as a series parallel system or a parallel series system. To, to do these representations, we have uh, in the reliability theory two ways to do that. The one way is the minimum path and the other way is the minimum cut. I will talk here about the minimum path. What is the minimum path? Uh, if you think that you are going inside here and trying to find some way in the other part, in, in the end point, what is the minimum path that this energy can go and the system are working? So if, you, if all components are working now, you can have this minimum path, like one, four, and is minimum. Or two, five, and it's a minimum. If component two failure, it's failed. And component four, it's failed, my system is still working because I have a minimum path that it will be one, three, and five. Or if component one failed and component five failed, the system is still working, and we have a minimum path two, three, and four. So all these minimum paths can be, can be built in a parallel structure. We have a series system here, we have a series system here, we have another series system here, and we have the last series system here. And all of them are in parallel. So these representations of the system has the same properties of failure of this one. Uh, how? For example, what I need for the system fail? What I needed to have the failure of the system? Ah, if component 4 and 5 failed, the system is broken. So my representation must have the same property. If component failure I have the failure of component 4, okay, this is broken. I have failure of component 5, okay, this is broken. I have the failure of 5, okay, this is broken. I have the failure of 4, this system is also broken. So, if these two are broken, also this system is broken. It's, I have the failure. Another option for the failure, 1, 3, and 5, all three failed. One, ah, I don't have the three here, but I have five. 
one and three and five. Oh, here, failed. And here I have three. So again, if one, three, and five are failed, we have the failure of the system. So how it's possible to have two components in different places in the same system? This is why I say it. We are working with a logical representation of the system. This is not necessarily the real structure of the system. Our system can have a real structure like this, but for a current system, we always can do a parallel representation, parallel series representation, or a series parallel representation. To build a parallel series representation, we use the minimum path. The series parallel representation is built by the minimum cut. Since this is not our main aim, how to do this difference, again, I call the attention to Barlow and Prochamp book, uh, let's go and move forward. So, what are here? We are here to talk about estimation of reliability. So, what will you guys should expect for us uh, in these two days? Uh, we are trying to estimate the reliability of each component. This is one important part. The second important part, the structure of the system is important for us. It's quite hard to work in this, in the, uh, not having some knowledge about this structure. Uh, depending on each problem that we work, we will have some different assumptions. So the first part that we are starting to discuss is how I can do a non-parametric Bayesian estimation of these reliability functions. How I can produce a non-parametric estimation and what are the, suppose, uh, the assumptions that we need for do that. But we have some limitations in this. Uh, for example, one of our limitations is that uh, we need the assumptions of independence between components. I can move forward to work without this restriction of independence. So then we go to parametric estimator of marginal reliabilities. We will be able to relax the restrictions of independence. And here when we are talking about independence, we are talking about statistical independence. Of course, when I have a system with two components, I don't have independence of these components because I need both to be working in a series system. So we are saying about statistical independence here. Uh, but again, I may not have all the information that I told you to you in this introduction. I may have some uh, open problems or may, I don't know who produced the failure. I know something about this, but what it is this something? So then we will work in a scenario of masked data. What this kind of masked data? Uh, I don't know all the informations that I was saying before. I must know the failure time, of course, but which component was responsible for this failure time? I may know something about this, but not necessarily exactly what component produced this failure. So how we can work on that? Okay, I will let this to later, and this is our main idea here. Uh, we are working on non-parametric based estimations, relax independence, going to a parametric model, then relax the conditions, the assumptions about the information available. I also can uh, call a remark here, uh, relating this to survival analysis. It's main, uh, uh, in survival analysis, the most part of work is, is it's common to find a competing risking Risky's model. Uh, in general, in survival analysis, what we are interested is, for example, uh, survival analysis is more related to biological systems, to time of failure of humans or some uh, 
uh, biological uh, methods or some time to appear a disease. So this is also important. We are calling here and saying that we are working with failure, failure and failure. But uh, we are working with time. So if we change this failure time, for example, uh, we have some uh, problems in survival analysis called by recurrence of a problem is not exactly a failure. If a person have a uh, disease like uh, cancer, you have cancer and you have the treatment. Ah, you have the cure of your cancer. But some time later, the cancer comes back. This is a new disease, a different cancer, or is a recurrence of the same one that you had before. So here, we are not in exactly working on this base, but this is also an, a problem common in survival analysis, and we can also have some relations about all this theory. The main part of reliability is to work on the idea of components. I usually say that uh, reliability is more, uh, it's more general than survival analysis, because we can work with components, these structures. Uh, in general, in survival analysis, the main problems are uh, a theory system, and generally, we only have two components, and you are not interested in all components. You are only interested in the time of one of these. But of course, I say that uh, reliability generalizes uh, survival analysis because, well, I needed to do some advertisement of my work, of course. I work with reliability, so I will say that. If someone works in reliability in survival analysis, he will say they oppose it. But it, the, it's quite similar. They are very similar in this idea. Okay. So let's talk about the Bayesian non-parametric problem. Uh, again, now we are starting to say some uh, new things. I told to you guys, ah, a well, current system can be work, uh, written in a series parallel or parallel series. So when we started working with this, let me give you some uh, story behind this work. The first one was working in a series system because it was the simple case. Then we move forward to parallel system. Okay, now I know solutions for parallel and for, seri for series and parallel system. But uh, I want to go further. I want to solve, for example, why I cannot solve a series parallel system? Or why I cannot solve a parallel series system. Moreover, if I have a current system that I can write as a series parallel system, I may use this to solve the problem of current system. So what I may call in attention here is, we are trying to solve this kind of system and this kind of system. Solve in which way? We are interested in find, or better, we are interested in estimate the reliability function of component one, the reliability function of component two, and the reliability function of component three. This uh, is our main interests. This is what we want. The same here, one, two, and three. The structures are different. This will change our estimator. The estimator of the component, you have some effect about this structure. Yes, it's different how we can do, uh, how we solve here and here. Okay, so uh, back into our toy example, a cough machine. It was a series system. Uh, okay. Then we have a parallel system, and in a series system, the time is the minimum of all components. In the parallel system, the time is the maximum of all components. And here, how I can represent the failure time of the system? So the first one, I have maximum here, and then I have the minimum of this part and this one. So the failure time of the system will be the minimum of x1 
and maximum of x2 and 3. Or if I think in the other one, you'll be the maximum of x1 and minimum of the other two. So this is important for us, these two definitions here. Also, we are also saying that we can, uh, we have the, the information, the information of who was the last component to failure is available to us. And, and the, here in the non-parametric, we have one more assumption. We cannot have two components failing at the same time. What is this? We cannot have component two and three failing at the same time. Why we need this assumption? Uh, from non-parametric uh, approach, we are working on this and we will not put any restrictions about uh, the distribution must be continuous, must be discrete. We don't have this kind of assumptions, but uh, if it both components failing at the same time, I am not able to say who was the responsible to the system failure. Because uh, it was two or three. What I do with these systems? If we think that uh, a machine working in a continuous process, this assumption is not a so hard assumption because uh, one component will fail before the other one. It may less than a millisecond, but one component will fail before the other. Uh, and here we will need, and this is what I am calling attention uh, all the time. What, uh, what I think the most important that we have here is not exactly how to solve the math problem to this. But uh, the main idea is we start with a structure, a current structure, then we can represent this current structure as in a logical way to the series and parallel system. Now we will change a little this problem again. So most, of, most part of the time what we are doing is how I can represent my problem to be a simple problem, and then I can easily solve. So the, the most part, part, important part of this tutorial, at least in my point of view, is not exactly how to estimate these components, but it's how I can turn my problem in a simple problem. So for the non-parametric estimator, of course, I am saying, we are not interested in the reliability of the system. But we have it. So I will not put this on trash. I will use this here. And also, we will define an, uh, another function. So, ah, OK, let me call attention again for one detail. I am saying reliability, reliability, reliability. Then I start to work with the distribution function. Why you are not using reliability? You'll be simple, the, uh, the notation will be simpler using distribution functions. And the reliability functions is just one minus FT. So it's just a way to write in a simple way and to the formulas be easier to be solved. And this is a sub-distribution function. Or you can think this in a joint function of time T and who is the responsible of the failure. Why I want to build this kind of sub-distribution function? The main here is thinking that I have three components. I only have three components. If I want to know the marginal of the sub-distribution functions, so I will do the marginal on delta. I will sum for delta equal one plus delta equal two plus delta, delta equal three. When I do this marginalization, what I have? The distribution functions of the system is equal to this plus this plus this. More important, if I use here one minus this, so add one and subtract one from this part, we can write this property. Why this property is important for us? I have one part, 
plus a second part, plus a third part, plus a fourth part. And all these parts has some equal one, and they are probabilities. So all of them are bigger than zero. What we have here? We just have a simplex in four dimensions. And uh, why we want to build this simplex in four dimensions? We have a direct relations to the simplex space with Dirichlet distributions. So a Dirichlet distribution is a, dip, uh, is a distribution where the sample space or the, the space of this distribution is the simplex. Why this is important for us? Because for noted, here we have functions of time t. If we fix this time t, for example, one, we have four numbers, four probabilities. And I can associate this as a multinomial model. Each one can happen with a Dirichlet distribution. When we are working with t as an uh, argument or our function, we have a Dirichlet process. But it's not just a Dirichlet process. It's a multivariate Dirichlet process because we are working with a four-dimensional simplex. Uh, also, I should call the attention here because uh, we, I am calling this a four-dimensional simplex. Of course, this simplex only have three dimensions. Once I know three of them and the sum must be one, the last one, I know what is. So the four-dimensional simplex is on dimension three. Uh, we can represent this in a dimension three. Okay. So uh, why, why are we keeping this in four dimensions? Uh, it will be simpler to, to disinvolve and uh, to produce our work. Uh, and also, we have an important thing here that using this uh, subdistribution function, we can use it just, for example, an empirical estimator for subdistribution function. I know the failure time. I know what component produces the failure. So I can just use an uh, empirical distribution for this joint here. Why I cannot do this directly to the component? Remember, I have missing data. I have a sensor time. I cannot use directly the empirical estimator for components because uh, I don't have all the information. But here I can, because here I have all necessary information for do that. So this is, you'll be in some way the basis of uh, uh, our work. Uh, not exactly it is the basis of our work, but uh, the results of uh, the Dirichlet process will appear in function of the empirical estimator of sub-distribution function. Uh, and more, generally we will call this by n plus the sum instead to divide it by n. And from the last property, we can write this. Uh, oh, ah, okay. And the, the notation here, when we have this small n, we are calling this by the empirical uh, function. When we don't have this n, is the theoretical uh, subdistribution of the system. Okay. So, working on this, our model here in the non-parametric estimator is a multinomial model. And this multinomial model we are calling for having probability P1 of T, P2 of T, P3 of T, P4 of T. Given T, this is just a simple multinomial model. Okay, T is not given. So this is for each T we have a multinomial model and our likelihood can be rotated in this way. What we are doing? At time t, how many failures was produced by component one? This is this j indicator. At time t, how many component twos has failed? At time three, and 
the system. What was not produced by these components is this. Uh, okay, we come here because this is the subdistribution of each component, and here is reliability. It may kind of strange to say how many is failed by one, by two, by three. This must be zero. Uh, Almost, because we have this one minus here, so this is the reliability. It's a little different from zero. But, uh, okay, this uh, work, why? We are looking for the joint distribution, so all what we have here is all system that does not have failure before the time t. So, at time t, we for, let me see. Let me say, uh, we have uh, four samples. The first one was failed by component one, the second one by component three, the third one by component three, at time five. So at time five, I still have one system working. This is what we have here. The at time time, one system is, is still working. Okay. Uh, and under this scenario, we can work with a multivariate Dirichlet process. This is a definition of multivariate Dirichlet process. However, I will try to not follow this definition, and I will try to explain this. Why? Uh, at least for me, the Dirichlet process by himself is already too much complicated. If we look to the multivariate Dirichlet process, then the things are starting to be a little more crazy. In the Dirichlet process, we are working with one function, or in a simplex of time uh, size two dimensional, one function and one minus this function. And uh, we can work this by a poly Warns process, Chinese restaurant process, we have some uh, ways to explain the Dirichlet process. However, for the multivariate Dirichlet process, it's quite complicated. So I will try to do in the most simple way. What we need in the multivariate Dirichlet process? I will have one mesh, uh, my measure space, so I will have these parameters, and these parameters of my process will be some measures of my sample space, and these measures, the, the parameters are not fixed values. They will depend on where I am working. What is my T? However, we can do a very interesting representation of this Dirichlet process that is a conditional representation. So, if we consider any Dirichlet process, each one with measure alpha, we can write uh, all these Dirichlet process are mutually independent uh, from this quantity rho, that I am not talking about this quantity yet. Then we can define a P star that will be just rho plus P1. This vector of P star and now, who is the vector that I want to build my multivariate process? No, the Dirichlet distribution with this. Measure with this. Then univariate Dirichlet process. Then assumptions of independence of these parameters of the Dirichlet distribution uh, are independent and build this. Ho1 plus P1. Uh, Oh, okay, so I don't need to use my memory now. Uh, what we have is, uh, these P stars in some way are conditional measures, conditional on marginal, and these characterizations, we can build our Dirichlet process in working with each univariated process. The whole process is something like, I am always talking about, how I can cut, how I can change, how I can uh, do an, a partition of my work, how I can partition the problem. If you think that a multivariate process can be something like a, uh, let me change my problem to a multinomial problem. If I have a worn 
with uh, three balls, uh, uh, with balls with three colors. I have color red, color blue, and color white inside my worm. I have a multinomial distribution here. However, if I only interest in the color head, I have a binomial distribution. It is head or it's not head. Doesn't matter if it's blue or white. So this is the same idea that we use to build the Dirichlet multivariate process. We think for the first component against the others. So I have a conditional univariate Dirichlet process. Then I go to the next one and look to the other ones. This is what we are calling these P stars quantities. And in this way, we can use this derivative multivariate process to our problem. The good part for us is that the theory behind here is quite complicated. However, uh, we will see soon that the estimation in our case using this Dirichlet variate and multivariate process will be quite simple. So, wow, well, I have a good way to do an estimation and a huge background. Uh, our sample space here is zero to infinite. Uh, we are calling a measure rho by the probability of delta B equal J. What this is in reliability theory, and again, calling attention of, we have reliability functions, but we also have the reliability of one component. And this is the reliability of the component. What is reliability of the component? Is the probability that that component you produce the failure of your system. So if we are working on this idea, I here integrating on T, I am trying to look to the marginal distribution of each component is the worst in my system or is the best in my system, the better one. Uh, why I needed this kind of information? Sometimes I may, start, uh, I may be interested in the time, for example, in a company that are producing televisions, I want to know how many televisions will fail before one year. If after one year, and uh, of course, this is a kind of joke, I hope that uh, nobody of uh, manufacturers televisions are listening to me now, so what is the best scenario for the manufacturers? All televisions must work inside the warranty, and one day of the warranty, I hope that all televisions are broken, because then you will need to buy another one. So I will want more money. In this case, I am interested that the televisions must work inside my warranty. Uh, after that, I'm not interested anymore. However, I don't want to do this in a plane. Uh, because, uh, no, no, I can guarantee to you that my plane, I am a plane producer, my plane will fly for one year, I can, I give you warranty of that. Uh, no, I think this is not a good idea to buy this plane, because uh, if this plane produce a failure, this is not a failure, this is a tragedy, so no. And then we want to build the best possible system. And to build the best possible system, it's important to know what are the components there that can be the weaker components. I will try to look at these components to improve the reliability of the system. I want to know and I need to know where I must improve. Not just uh, if, for example, I have uh, in a plane a piece of plastic that is broken a lot, but this piece of plastic never produced the failure of the plane. So I will not put my money developing in this piece. I will put my money developing the piece that is important to the working of the component, to the working of the system. Okay. Um, working here in a conditional way, so this is some kind of uh, definitions. We need these conditional distributions. We have the sub-distributions functions, 
and we can just write the sub-distributions as the product of H1 and P1. Why I wanted to build this in this way? It's the same that we did here. We are just putting the notations equal to solve the problem. And working on this base, we can, I am uh, skipping now the theoretical part, we can show that for each t, the distribution of this vector is a Dirichlet process with measure alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, and sum of alpha from t to infinity. All of this is from 0 to t, and here from t to infinity is what is working yet. But what is not a failure yet. Uh, okay, so I have this distribution, I have my prior process here, and uh, I have, well, the likelihood function. So I have multinomial function, directionally multivariate process as prior, and we have the multivariate directionally process as posterior. And also, if you remember, I called the attention for the empirical estimator of distribution functions, and the good thing is our posterior process is just a combinations of our prior measure with observed data, prior measure, observed data, and this is for all components. And we know the expectations of this multivariate process. So, given data, the expectation of F star is just a mean, a combination of prior measure, and observe data. So, in some way, we have a conjugate prior, we have conjugacy, and it's not complicated to work, and this uh, combination is given in some way, in a simple way. But okay, I am working in the sub-distribution. I need to work with distribution. So, how I can relate my sub-distribution to the distributions of to reliabilities or to our main interest here. Uh, the non-parametric estimations we already have for sub-distribution, so we wanted to know about our problem. The first property that I told you before, uh, the set of F star and Fj will always have the same jump points, jump points on T. However, one, two, and three cannot have the same jump points. F1 star and F1 has obligatorily the same jump points, but I cannot have two components failing at the same time. Also, considering now the structures, we know under independence that the reliability of the system can be written in this way for series parallel system, or in this way for parallel series system. Uh, this is just a minimum and maximum distributions of under, uh, independent handle variables. So it's not complicated. And we have a relation of the sub-distributions function can be wrote by an integral of this. For all sub-distribution functions under SPS, and under PSS, you'll be quite different, but we can do that. What we are interested now is, we don't want to write this in functions of that. We want to do the inverse of this formula. What we want is F1 as a function of F1 star, F2 star, and F3 star to solve our problem. And we are able to do that. Again, I am skipping some uh, theoretical details because uh, to come here we will need probably half of an hour, so I think it's better to skip this theory. And uh, if any one of you would like to know more about the, the details, just talk to me. Uh, so here we have now F1 in functions of F1 star, F2 star, F3 star. Why we have an integral and a product, and why we have these symbols here? As I 
said before, we are working in any condition of the distribution or the distribution of the random variable of the components. We are not putting the restrictions of it must be continuous, must be discrete. We are saying must be anything. So this is a part of a continuous. Uh, this part of integral is from continuous. So we try to put a C in the middle of integral. And the product part are for the discrete points. So we added, uh, well, a D. The symbol is a little better. In the middle of the product part. OK. And uh, we have the same for F2. Uh, we have the same for PSS. And we can do all this math to find these details. And more important, using our Dirichlet process, we can write the expectation of F1 given data. What is this? We can write the mean posterior of function, distribution functions of component one, of component two, and of component three under each kind of scenario. Series parallel system for F1, F2, parallel series systems for F1, F2. So we are working in three components, but I may have this. I have four components, not only three. So now how can I extend all of this to a more complicated problem? How I can extend it all of we did it? If you think the first picture, one component in series with two components in parallel. If I consider that these two components here are one system, I can write this as a series parallel system. I call this x1 by the maximum of these two, and I have my first structure. In this way, I can estimate the component two and three. Uh, if I am interested in component one and four, I will take the max, sorry, the one and two. If I am trying to do these two, take the maximum here, you will need, you will have a new representation, and again, you can solve the problem. Uh, a simple example, uh, we simulated 100 samples. Uh, we have different distributions for all components in the system. And performing analysis, we have one important detail about the prior measure. We give a prior measure in sub-distribution space. So it's not easy to do that. It's much easier to elicitate a prior in original problem. So using these relations here, we elicitate a prior in this space and find what was the, our prior for subdistribution functions. This is why these priors may find a little, ex is, uh, little different, but what we are using is Exponential with mean one for all component as measured prior for the Dirichlet multivariated prior. So we have now two things. One is the Dirichlet multivariate process as prior, and we needed to put some measure for each alpha with what we are doing in this way. Uh, we have all uh, way to structure our system. And in this scenario, this is also important. Component one is sensor 77% of time. Component two, 64, 73, and 86. Generally, in survival analysis, we try to work with in the maximum of 20% of sensor. Here, generally, we have at the maximum 20% of observed times for each component. So it's a huge sensor. And I can say that the estimations are quite good. Uh, this uh, dashed point line was our prior for the component. The dashed line is the distribution function that we use it to generate this system. So uh, I don't have too much time more today. So please remember me for tomorrow to explain how we generated all this data.
Uh, it's not a, it's simple, but uh, there is some tricks to generate the data because we are generating system. But uh, here the main picture for today is the non-parametric estimator, you are looking, oh, this is an empirical distribution. Call uh, your attention for this part in the beginning. You are seeing a continuous part here. It is not easy to see, but uh, in all these steps, this is not a horizontal line. It is in some way a little increasing line. So we have the points of jump and continual parts. Mainly these continual parts came from our prior assumptions and for, from our model. And the discrete points are coming from our data, where the system or where the components had failed. And, well, considering that we have 75% of sensor, I can say, yeah, this is quite good. Uh, I will keep the suspense for tomorrow, but uh, it's important to say one thing here too. We have many assumptions here. Independence between components, no common set of jump points, and, uh, well, mainly about the independence. This is a huge assumption. When I put all components working together, I don't expect it, independence of these components. So here we need this assumption. Tomorrow we will talk more about how to relax this condition of independence and the other models. And for today, I think, uh, well, we can have some coffee now, right? Yeah? Thank you.